What's up, everybody? Hello and welcome into another YouTube live show. I am John Kurtz. Uh, tonight, a little mixed bag of a lot of different stories that have coalesced. A lot of talk on the Super League, right? We chatted at length about the Super League on Wednesday night, which was and is, I shouldn't say was, it's not dead yet, even though the title is Dead on Arrival. That is what someone in the SEC has called the Super League, which is going to need the approval of the SEC, the Big Ten, and Oh, by the way, Fox and ESPN to ever work. It has taken a lot of public shots in the last week since the story came out midweek uh, about this Super League that has been thrown out there. It was a lot of good reporting from The Athletic, Andrew Marchand, Stuart Mandel, uh, a couple of guys who were on top of that story. It included 80 teams, if you missed that show, included 80 teams, all the Power Fives, and there would be a relegation and promotion system that would come from the lower level of that all the power fives current power fives former power fives in washington state and oregon state would have been guaranteed a spot to stay in this without any relegation or anything like that that was the general idea a big part of this would be fighting the lawsuits that are coming up there would have been revenue sharing there still would have been an unequal split of the revenue that was coming into everybody that would be displaced to the Big Ten and the SEC, they would get more than everybody else. Um, and we'll get into more of a quick synopsis of it. But that whole proposal, which would be better objectively for the overall state of the game, but not as advantageous for the Big Ten and the SEC, as you might expect, is really taking some shots from those corners of the college football world. So get into some analysis on that. John Wilner, I thought, actually had a, a really good take on it and uh, a really good spin on – why his theory is that eventually we get something like this. It's just going to take until into the 2030s and it probably will not be 80 teams. I thought he had some really good things to say about it. Uh, so we've got the super league. We are one step closer to directly paying players in college athletics. We have a new uh, NIL. I guess you could call it like a proposal NIL proposal from NCAA Division I Athletics, the NCAA Division I Council has a new proposal for NIL that would get us one step closer. I mean, it still feels a little bit stupid that we're not just letting schools directly pay players, but we're getting now like, oh, you can officially as a school work with the collective to pay the players. You still can't pay them yourselves, but you can work with the collective to directly pay the players. That's where we're at on that right now. So Ross Dellinger has a lot of details there and where that may be headed in the future. Florida State, Win some, loses some in court. Uh, and the biggest win, really, for everybody involved is that it, it appears that we are going to be able to see some of the details that both the ACC and ESPN do not want out there, particularly ESPN, because they feel they're trade secrets. Uh, we're going to get to see some of those, some but not all. Uh, also can get into some Brett Yormark notes here. Didn't get into it last time. I still owe you a video on that. And Brett Yormark, uh, of course, his interview with 365 Sports, which I thought was excellent. And even some thoughts on John Wilner saying, basically, Brett Yormark absolutely killed it in the negotiation with the college football playoff to get the revenue split that he did for the Big 12 over the ACC, which was a very interesting point that we have discussed, but probably just glossed over a little bit, uh, just how good of a job Yormark did in advocating for the Big 12 and what they should be getting of the revenue split out of the college football playoff. But that's your primer for tonight. That's what I have on the agenda. You guys know, though, if you've been around here, you can be a part of the show as well. You can control the content tonight. You can do so by clicking the dollar sign below the chat box in order to submit a donation. It will make it a super chat, pin it in a separate column for me, and guarantees that you get on the show tonight. Uh, much appreciate all of you guys who do that and support the channel that way. But you do not have to. You can also just simply like the video to support the channel. That is a totally free and easy way to support everything that I am doing here to bring you conference realignment, college football, college basketball content here on this channel on a regular basis. So if you could click the like button, I would really appreciate that as well. And leave a comment uh, underneath the video as well. How you feel about this super league? And do you think it does have any chance of ever happening? Not just right now, but ever happening. Will we ever get this super league, some form of this idea? Let me know in the comments. And if you're not watching this live, it is John dash Kurtz dash four on venmo if you would like to contribute to the channel there and if you leave your question or comment with the donation i will read it to kick off the next show so you can be a part of the show even if you are not tuning in live and that's what i have for you so we are off and running tonight and we're going to start with the super league and the reaction to that because that is 
it's been a huge story in the college football sphere this week and, and college athletics, but obviously college football centric here, a super league that would just be football. Everything else would remain the same. Um, could stick with more of the regional conferences here, but uh, the Super League would would change things with the top 80. This is from On3. So On3 says, the House versus NCAA class action lawsuit is slated to begin trial on January 27th, 2025, less than 300 days away, which that is, I, I was reading that earlier, and I was like, damn, I, you know, th- that seems like such a big thing off in the distance. It's never going to get here. It's never going to come. That's like how it felt with the four incoming teams to the Big 12 at one point. Man, that's a date way off in the distance. Never going to come. It will come. Newsflash. It will come. Um, So we are less than 300 days away from the class action lawsuit, the House case. Simply put, if the NCAA and Power Four conferences lose, they could owe thousands of athletes some $4.2 billion in retroactive NIL pay and broadcast revenue. And NIL rule changes could take hold that would permit schools and conferences to pay NIL dollars to athletes for any reason, including athletic performance. Uh, Leaders and stakeholders openly discussing this is a step forward. Uh, Okay, so skipping ahead here a little bit in the article, it's my fault in the way that I copied it there. The intro paragraph there is kind of setting the stage for this. And one of the reasons that people feel a super league and the concept of this could be potentially viable at some point. I know like Andrew Marshand has emphasized some of this may well get used. And the hope for the super league is that the lawsuits basically force everybody into it um, is because of that house case and what that could do with the rule changes, how that will change the structure of college athletics and what's going down. Obviously the payments that all the schools are going to have to make as well. Um, that is a, a huge reason that some people feel there is at least a little bit of legitimacy to the Super League. Um, so now the fact that it's actually out there and being talked about openly has hit the media um, and has been talked about to at least one conference, although not everybody, but it has been talked about to the ACC. Uh, this is where the On3 article goes with that in mind. It says leaders and stakeholders openly discussing this as a step forward, but the plan does not have any legs at the moment. Uh, Multiple collegiate leaders are pushing back on the subject. The Big Ten and SEC Joint Advisory Group uh, are surely working out a plan. Multiple sources told On3 that their ideal Super League would consist of 30 teams. So there you go. Uh, Instead of 80, (laughs) the ideal Super League for the Big Ten and the SEC would be 30 teams. A little bit different there, and that's basically going to cut out almost every single team that's not in it right now. If you haven't made the club yet, you're going to be in some trouble there. My friend Um, leaves very little wiggle room for anybody else to get into the super league. If it's going to be a 30 team deal, that is very much more the super league that has been discussed before we found out about the 80 team proposal that was out there. Everybody figured the super league would be quite literally like the top 20 to 30 brands take their ball and go home and everybody else figure it out. Um, and SEC, this was the the money quote that came out of this uh, per on three. An SEC head football coach told on three that he discussed the Super League idea with his athletic director Wednesday night, and he agreed the idea has a tough road ahead. Quote, it's nothing, the coach said. Uh, my AD told me that it's DOA, a.k.a. dead on arrival. Uh, there's no way the SEC will go with this idea. And look, I don't know that we really needed to see that to understand that that was the reality that's just some confirmation of what we all would have suspected here it's got no chance to get the big 10 or the sec on board even in the story in the athletic it was saying the big 12 hasn't even like had an official meeting here to really throw its full full weight behind it which is pretty interesting because the big 12 would be one of the leagues that would stand to benefit a little bit more at least the individual schools for sure um we all knew the SEC and the Big Ten have things tilted so far in their favor right now. They would not be likely to give that up. Part of the premise in that article was that, hey, there could be untapped TV dollars out there because if you did it like this, you could structure it more like the NFL, take more control of putting the best games in the best spots and all of that. But I think a lot of people are very skeptical of that and thus would be skeptical of this ever coming around to working because, look, money talks. Like, it would have to be – would have to be out the money about the money and right now another point that's been made and i know ross dellinger made this point the college football playoff agreement with espn is basically evidence that nobody wants to do this right now because that's 
that's locked up an advantageous deal for ESPN now for a while. They're they're obviously not going to want to go back on that and and break that up. And it's an advantageous deal for ESPN because they didn't have to deal with much actual competition. Um, it didn't turn into a giant bidding war between a bunch of the networks. They just kind of went to ESPN, handed it over, and said, "Here you go." Um, so you're not likely to get any backtracking on that. And now the SEC and Big Ten have just kind of confirmed this. So the whole point of bringing it up on Wednesday was not for me to say, hey, I think this is a realistic thing that could could very well happen. I definitely did not, because the obvious there is the Big Ten and the SEC. And even more so than that, it's the two TV entities. It's Fox and ESPN. They're not going to want to jump on board uh, to do that. Legalities could also hold up the uh, the plan, the CST plan, which is college sports tomorrow. Uh, including antitrust issues, plus power conferences are locked into long-term TV deals. ESPN and Fox won't just make way for a new college football model. Multiple stakeholders believe the easy solution to the NCAA's current problems is a revenue share model and collective bargaining agreement that can be standardized across FBS. So as I said, people like Andrew Marchand were saying, hey, the lawsuits, the NCAA issues, that could be a reason some of this stuff would have a chance to, uh, to take hold. Multiple stakeholders here are saying the easy solution is a revenue sharing model and collective bargaining agreement that can be standardized across the FBS. They're saying like, look, we can take care of that without having to go to this super league thing. We can maintain all of our advantages for the big 10 of the sec. And then just collective bargaining agreement, revenue sharing model. We'll be good to go. If we're sharing revenue, we're going to have more revenue than everybody else. So we're still going to keep our advantages over everybody there. So that's been the reaction as you might expect. Again, my whole point in bringing it up Wednesday was that there are legitimate people in the sport trying to do something, attempting to do something. And it's a pretty good idea. And and in addition to this pushback that has definitely been out there from a lot of people like, Hey, this would never work. Big 10 or sec would never get on board. TV networks would never get on board. What's the motivation. I did also see a lot of reaction that was very much like, Hey, this, this actually seems like a pretty good idea. And then a lot of people followed up with, which means that it won't ever happen because it's college football and we don't do things that are good for the sport, um, which is a p- completely fair criticism, obviously, considering the position that the sport is in right now. But a lot of people seem to like it. Uh, fairly legitimate actors are putting their weight behind it now, at least like people within the game. When I say fairly legitimate, like it's not just somebody with a Twitter account or a YouTube channel, right? Throwing out uh, hypotheticals and how they could do it. It's people that are legitimately involved in the sport or at least making an attempt there. And, uh, and yeah, it did have people saying like, Hey, parts of this could be siphoned off and actually used, even if it's not the whole thing wouldn't catch and be used right now. So it's, it's certainly something worth monitoring, even if a lot of people did want to take the the chance to kind of, I wouldn't necessarily say dunk on it, but just sort of poo poo the idea, poo poo the, the thought that the idea could ever legitimately be something that is used. Now, I thought John Wilner had a really interesting take on this. And I mentioned on that show on Wednesday that John Wilner was somebody who had kind of written about this already. He did it in a in a piece where he sort of was extrapolating on what he thought the future of all this looked like, what the next decade or so of college athletics would wind up looking like. And it was pretty good. I would highly recommend you go read it if you can uh, if you can track it down. But I want to read you his take on this because he kind of reiterates and and doubles down on what he said earlier. First, though, Got to get to a couple of super chats. Appreciate you guys. Like my guy, Daniel. Thank you for being here, Daniel. Cat fan in Husker land, AKA Daniel Osborne. Hope you and the family are doing great. And uh, I appreciate you. No message today from uh, Daniel. I'm not seeing one in the live chat there, but thank you for your support as always. Daniel, it is much, much, much appreciated, my friend. Uh, And David, what's up, David? David says uh, the Super League dilutes the games eyeball wise, which is what uh, the power to is moving away from. Uh, yeah, I mean, that that was, which article was it? I was reading one of the articles that I read today was talking about just that. Oh, actually it was Wilner. I think we're going to read it in just a minute. It was Wilner saying like, Hey, you know, nobody wants to watch like Cal Syracuse. So why would the TV network sign up for something that's going to require them to then be televising more Cal Syracuse games, even if they are getting some of the bigger brands too, they can just consolidate the bigger brands, only take those and only have those games on their TV network. So yes, the, the point that you are making is an accurate one there. Uh, That that's what they're trying to get away from. Exactly. So in, in some ways there would be backtracking for both TV and the big 10 and the sec. Um, 
I think the hope is just that lawsuits, changes in structure, where all this goes could somehow push you back to something kind of resembling what that proposal is. But for it to be 80 teams, that that definitely seems like the uh, most unrealistic piece of it. And it's because of what you're talking about, David. So fair enough. Fair point there. Matthew, what's up, Matthew? Uh, Matthew says Purdue or UConn on Monday. I mean, I feel like you just can't go against UConn. They've been such a dominant force. It felt like Alabama really played a a pretty damn good game yesterday. And uh, UConn for a while wasn't particularly spectacular by their standards. And they still, I mean, they got pushed a little bit, but it still was never super duper in doubt uh, who was going to win that game in the, in the last like 10 minutes or so of it when they kind of regain control. So I, I can't go against, I can't go against UConn at this point. Uh, Purdue would be the better story. I will be rooting for Purdue. Uh, certainly I would prefer not to have back-to-back champs. And Purdue kind of gives hope to schools that are not a blue blood or a new blood here um, if they are able to win the title. So I'll be fascinated to watch, see what Zach Eady can cook up there. I think we we got obviously the best championship game we we could possibly have. Everybody loves upsets in the tournament, but when you get down to this type of the uh, of the tournament, you want really great matchups, and this is as good a matchup as we could have asked for with Purdue and UConn. So I'm excited about that. But put me down for the Huskies. Put me down for the Huskies, Matthew. Michael, what's going on, Michael? Thank you for your support as always, my friend. Uh, Michael says, Kurtz to Provo Fund. Yes, sir. Uh, if you can make it out, I've got a ticket or two for you to the game. Let's go. All right. Okay. I dig that. Maybe I can I just have to see if I can get my guy Cole to uh, to uh, opt to go with me to uh, to that one. Kurtz to Provo Fund. I, uh, yeah, okay. That's you bet, Michael. I will, I will remember that one. Uh, and I, I got to make it to that game, man. I got to make it to that game. Got to make it out to Provo for that. So looking forward to it, Michael. Thank you very much. Uh, if anybody else has any tickets to offer me, you are more than uh, than welcome to on the show tonight as well. But it doesn't take just that. You can also click the dollar sign below the chat box uh, to attach a donation to your chat and uh, pop in and be a part of the show tonight. Would appreciate that. Uh, all super chats, very welcome. All regular chats, welcome as well. And if you could like the video, I would really appreciate that. Totally free way to support the channel. Just one click. And leave me a comment in the comment section under the video as well. John Dash Kurt Stash 4 on Venmo. If you aren't watching live, you can leave your question or comment there and I will get to it on the next show. So here's John Wilner, kind of alluded to this. This is his commentary on the Super League. He says nine years is when he expects something like this to kick in. Nine years, not six or eight, not 10 or 12, nine. That time frame is the result of deep thinking about this very topic, mostly during the fall but we'll get to that piece momentarily. Here's Wilner's view in what he says are three easy to digest steps. We commend Perna and his group. That would be that college sports tomorrow group. We commend Perna and his group for finally going public with their plan. Transparency is always better, especially when so many public universities are involved. Uh, Number two, the super league concept stands no chance of materializing in the next few years big piece of that is because the TV networks have already signed up for not only the playoff, but just inking deals with the sec and the big 10. They've just gone through that pretty recently here. And number three, some type of super league will arise at the end of the decade or in the early 2030s. Wilner says this is college football. The sport starts and ends with the sec and big 10, which means it really starts and ends with their media partners, ESPN and Fox respectively. The Super League would require the sports two grandmasters to rip up contracts with their conferences, contracts that were signed recently in smart business decisions. As we have discussed ad nauseum here on the show, again, of course, the TV networks, big factor in this. Those deals include ESPN's six-season extension of the college football playoff deal, 2026 to 31, which carries a $1.3 billion annual price tag and is also a good deal for ESPN. Why? Because none of the other networks offered a competitive bid, so ESPN grabbed the event at a relative discount, which is still a little bit puzzling to me. It made sense to do it like the NFL would do the playoffs and the Super Bowl, get multiple networks involved there. If you're getting them bidding against each other and for different portions of it instead of just the whole thing, you know, you're not going to get like a discount for the whole thing. You're just pricing it off by piece. It still seemed to be the way to make the most money out of it, but ESPN was able to get it. So they're not going to want to get that up, uh, long story short. 
Uh, the agreement reached last month is based on the existence of four power conferences. The Super League needs eight divisions. So you see the problem. Yeah, Super League was pitching like eight, ten team divisions. Uh, whereas right now we have the four conferences. Unless ESPN is willing to void a favorable contract, the Super League is a non-starter. And, you know, if you've been paying attention to ESPN lately, they're not going to be doing anything that is going to be forfeiting money just for the greater good of anybody. When has ESPN acted in the greater good of the sport? Never. Uh, that's not something that they do. It's constantly always just been about ESPN and, and how to make the most money and maximize profits for them. You're, you're not going to get them acquiescing to anything just for the betterment of the sport. Uh, in fact, the Super League will only materialize when it makes sense for ESPN and Fox and when the media rights contracts with the individual conferences are aligned in a manner that allows for a tectonic shift in the structure of the sport. Uh, the current arrangement creates inefficiency in supply. Each conference has its own media deal, and that benefits the demand side, which is the networks. As noted above, the hotline gave the issue much consideration and published a vision for the future of the sport in late November prior to the final Pac-12 football championship game. In our vision, the Super League forms in the mid-2030s. So he's talking about the mid-2030s. That's it's a long ways off. I mean, we're talking about a decade out here. It's when John Wilner envisions a Super League actually taking hold. And he says that would be when the SEC's contract with ESPN is winding down. And the Super League, according to Wilner, is not 80 teams. It's also not 20 teams, which is what was floated out earlier by On3 as the ideal number for sources inside the big 10 and the sec but wilner lands at 24 24 so everybody who's not in the big 10 of the sec right now take inventory of that i guess you've got you got a decade to jostle for position to be one of the best 24 brands out there to uh to take in and be a part of the super league Wilner says 80 is an inefficient number for the networks why would espn or fox or apple or amazon pay top dollar to broadcast Minnesota versus Boston College and Cal versus Texas Tech. I'm glad at least that we got Minnesota in there. Like, give me one of the teams that's not a primary brand in the Big Ten and, and roll that out there as an example. Stop picking on the Big 12 and even the ACC in all of this. You got to pick on some of the low-hanging fruit in the Big Ten and, and SEC for that matter, but particularly the Big Ten, uh, which is what really drives me nuts. He says that's not good business. Good business is paying top dollar for Ohio State versus Clemson and Oklahoma versus USC and Notre Dame versus Georgia and only those caliber of games. Maybe the networks could make the numbers work for a 32 or 40 team league, but not 80, not even 60 or 70. 32 or 40. I mean, I do feel like I do feel like 40 was kind of if you're if you're a Big 12 team, that's kind of your like high hopes. Like maybe we can be good enough to sneak into a 40 team super league if that's how far it expands. But that definitely seems to be pushing the outer limits of it there. And that is as where Wilner is going with it. He says, so as we see it, the super league concept currently making the rounds doesn't satisfy the needs of the only two entities that matter in college football, ESPN and Fox only when the economics work for the networks, will the revolution unfold. So that was the main chunk of Wilner's thoughts. He had a couple of other points I wanted to read in a mailbag in just a moment, but uh, let's, let's hop back into the super chats here for a moment. If you want to be a part of the show tonight, click the dollar sign below the chat box in order to do so to attach a donation to your chat and make it a super chat and hop on here. Just like my guy, David getting back in. Appreciate you, David. Uh, David says would have loved the old big A plus Texas and Iowa to make up one of the 10 team leagues. Yeah. Hey, I would be very much here for that the stuff that I was seeing was much more pushing it to like the Southwest conference. You'd have like Texas, Texas A&M, Texas tech, uh, Baylor, TCU, Houston, Oklahoma, Oklahoma state. Uh, I'm sure I'm missing a team or two in there, but that is kind of the league. So then it was, it was literally like the old school, like big eight plus yeah. Who else was floating around in there? But yeah, the general idea there in the, if you did the eight, 10 team divisions thing would be basically having like an old big eight conference. You'd be, you'd be going back, which I know, I know some people would really love. I mean, to me, I grew up with the big 12. So the league that, that I know and love and appreciate the most and would want to go back to the most is like the OG big 12, but I can appreciate the big eight as well. You know, I was alive for, 
what, six years of the Big Eight? I guess six years of the Big Eight before we went to the Big 12 in 1996. Um, so I was alive for part of it. Bring me, bring me the Big Eight. That would be great, too. And David, I believe you're a Nebraska fan, correct? So David says that as a Nebraska fan would be in favor of bringing back the old Big Eight plus, uh, plus Texas and Iowa. Texas would be a tough one to bring in there. They're probably going to go to uh, whatever version of the Southwest Conference would be in there in this purely hypothetical scenario. Now I am the YouTube guy talking about the, the hypothetical scenario. Uh, but maybe Iowa. Maybe I, Iowa could be a part of that. Bring, uh, bring the Cyhawk rivalry into, uh, into your 10-team division. Andrew, what's up, Andrew? Appreciate you being here. Thank you, my friend, for your support of the channel. Andrew says, with private equity coming, what if Brett Yormark hit up the Saudis? Uh, why stop at golf? Keep up the good work. Provo Fund attached. Hey, more get John to Provo Fund cash. I appreciate it, Andrew. Um, would Brett Yormark hit up the Saudis? You know, Brett Yormark, I'm sure, would be somebody that would be open to hearing what the benefits of private equity would be. I'm sure if that Brett Yormark haters out there, like, like John Canzano, who continue to try and paint him as – this like wheeler dealer, like almost irresponsible wheeling, dealing used car salesman, slimy guy fitting that narrative would definitely be getting in bed with the private equity that comes from over there for sure. I think Florida state will be like first in line on that. I, I would have a hard time seeing Brett Yormark like breaking the seal on that, but that you are definitely going down a dangerous path. And I realize that the college sports tomorrow plan was tied in with some private equity as well but you're definitely going down a dangerous path there because for them, it's going to be all about the bottom line and making money over everything. And uh, they would not care at all about the good of the sport. So I do think there's risk reward there, but I would say that Brett Yormark would be, he is not somebody that would just totally shut that idea down. I would have to imagine he would be somebody that would take the meeting. Whereas, you know, maybe like a Jim Phillips, who's got more of a conventional background in the ACC. Maybe he's not willing to, uh, to take the meeting. Um, I think a lot of leaders in college athletics who have been around the sport their entire lives would be built more like that. Whereas Brett Yormark is uh, somebody who's proven to be more innovative, willing to listen, willing to try and push the envelope. So would still have a hard time seeing it happen without it becoming more of a precedent already set by somebody else. But um, I think it's a fair point. I think it's a fair point that Yormark would be somebody who could be willing to, uh, to listen to that. So appreciate you, Andrew. Uh, thank you for, uh, for hopping in there. All right, I want to read this from the mailbag of John Wilner, who he got a question about uh, Brian Rolap, who we talked about last time. He was the NFL representative who was one of Roger Goodell's right-hand men who's a part of this uh, Super League proposal in college sports tomorrow. The question was just how significant is the presence of Brian Rolap, the NFL's chief media and business officer, in the group pitching the College Football Super League. And Wilner says, we don't view Rolap's presence as malicious with regard to this issue, but college football in general should be wary of NFL involvement on every level. And that's why I wanted to read this, because this is not something that I feel like has generated a lot of discussion. They're like, hey, you need to be really careful about the NFL getting too involved in this. Um, Wilner says the NFL is a threat, folks. Perhaps not an existential threat because college football provides a regulated labor pipeline but it absolutely threatens to limit the success of college football over the long haul. The latest evidence came recently when the NFL announced it would play two games on Christmas day in 2024. Christmas day is a Wednesday. It's abundantly clear to the hotline that the NFL is coming for every premium broadcast window in captivity. It might take a few years for its lawyers to circumvent the sports broadcasting act that protects college football and high school football in the fall. But eventually it will attempt to gain complete and total domination. And that's not good for college football. <sighs> Boy, I mean, I don't love, I don't love hearing that. Certainly I would not put it past the NFL to be coming for literally anything and everything. They obviously, I mean, they don't care about player safety, let alone what's going on with college football or high school football. I just didn't know that. I guess the thought is that they would find their lawyers are going to find a way to circumvent Sports Broadcasting Act and laws that would be out there to keep them from poaching college and high school football slots. But, you know, even with I, I've seen some grumbling with high school football folks here, like K-State is playing a, a Friday night game against Arizona coming up this year. And I saw some grumbling from high school folks about that. Like they're already starting to lose that battle with the college game. And I guess this is more instead of trickle down, like kind of trickle up here. 
or you could say it is trickle down starting with the NFL, but you're trying to gobble up more and more nights of football uh, throughout the week because people know that if you're a TV entity, it's one way to get good ratings. Throw some football out there, live sports. You can't skip through the commercials as they're happening live. It's a very valuable thing to have that. So putting it out there on more nights is better for everybody. I, I, look, I wouldn't trust. I mean, yeah, the NFL is going to be acting in the best interest of the NFL at all times, but I had not deemed it or realized that it was like that level of threats that John Wilner apparently uh, believes that it is, but he wanted to really put the word out about watch out for the NFL getting involved there. And that is one area in which they are at least somewhat involved in the college sports game right now. One final thing from his mailbag that I thought was great was <laughs> Says with the Big 12, this is a question that came in. Would the Big 12 and ACC actually have been better off in the new college football playoff contract if the Pac-12 had survived intact? Would that have provided more counterbalance to the Big 10 and SEC's demands? He says, absolutely. There's irony in all this. The breakup of the Pac-12 accelerated the consolidation of power by the SEC and Big 10 and the marginalization of the ACC and Big 12. Uh, the Big 12 in particular worked to destabilize the Pac-12 and probably lose the four corner schools because it understandably viewed realignment from a strength in numbers standpoint. But the 10 schools had stayed together in the Pac-12, but had the 10 schools stayed together and added San Diego State and SMU, the conference structure would not have tilted to the power two to the degree it has. The SEC and Big Ten were going to be the lead dogs for sure, but there would have been some measure of balance. Now there is none. I guess I was thinking, you know, we're talking about you only have four conferences to split the revenue of it. If the idea is maybe like, the percentage advantage for the SEC would decrease a little bit if you're having to distribute money then to three other main conferences instead of two. There probably is some truth to that. I think also it's, you know, I mean, the Big 12 still did absolutely what it should have in the moment. That was turning into kind of a zero-sum game where the, the Big 12 and the Pac-12 were kind of being pitted against each other, and I think that was still the smart move for the Big 12 in this Long term, but yeah, it did accelerate a little bit. Probably the fact that the ACC and Big Big Ten, or what am I talking about? I'm looking at ACC and Big Twelve. That the well, that the ACC and the Big Twelve are going to be less than. We got to hey, the SEC and Big Ten are here taking more money out of the college football playoff quicker than we probably would have there, and a little bit more tilted than we probably would have if the Pac-12 were still intact. But it was still. Very much so the better move for the Big 12's long-term survival. And I don't think that Wilner is really trying to say that it that it wasn't. Um, but it is an interesting thought. If you at least had a third conference, and so now it's like, hey, you, you are at least outnumbered by the amount of conferences that are here, uh, the amount of voices that can be in the room pushing back, the amount of conferences you're going to have to distribute money around to. Um, that could have changed some of the dynamics at least for a little bit. But ultimately, I I don't know that that really makes too much of a difference as to where the sport is going in general, and it would have been potentially harmful for the, the Big 12's long-term survival. But it was an interesting note, and that's a part of why I read all that. Like, John Willer is still – I know people have some mixed feelings about him from the Big 12, Pac-12 battle over the past summer, uh, but he's got some really good points on all this, and I do think he's a, he's a very good guy to read when talking on these big-picture issues in college athletics. All right, if you want to join the show tonight, click the dollar sign below the chat box in order to do so. Please like the video if you haven't yet. Would much appreciate that uh, as well. If you want to uh, help support the channel, it's totally free. Very easy way to support. You can also leave a comment in the comment section. And if you go to uh, Venmo, it's john kurtz 4 there. If you're not catching it live, you can leave me a question or comment, and I will get to it on the next show. Uh, let's hit up David here real quick because David has one more Super League thought for us. What's up, David? David says, with that Super League thought, was worried about the dollar distribution. Uh, teams would be stuck in a division with the top teams making so much more. After three to four years, no chance to compete in your own division. So we're talking about here, we're talking about the 80-team Super League, uh, worried about the dollar distribution in an 80-team Super League. Teams stuck in a division Teams will be stuck in a division with the top teams making so much more uh, after three to four years, no chance to compete in your own division. Okay. So because the idea with this super league was going to be, even the 80 team was going to be, Hey, the bigger brands will still get more of the money. So if you get stuck in a, in a league, like, you know, down South, that's going to be some version kind of of the sec and you get stuck with 
Alabama and Georgia and LSU, like all in the same conference, they're making more money than you. And that's your pod versus like the old big eight kind of division that we were talking about there. It would not be nearly as top heavy. Yeah. There would definitely be some bad luck involved in that for some. And that's, you know, maybe that's another part of the reason like why it would never happen. Like schools that are winning from, I call it like winning the birth lottery, just where they happen to be, um, you know, school in the South, Mississippi state, Ole Miss, like what they just happen to be in the South and attached at the hip with the biggest, baddest, most powerful conference out there. Now all of a sudden it kind of turns around on you then, right? If you have to get stuck in that division and it's just division winners, plus the eight wild cards that are going to, uh, to move on to the playoff in that scenario, all of a sudden life becomes, life becomes pretty damn hard there. Not that that's too crazy different from what it is right now already um, because they do have to play in the SEC, but it could be a little bit harder if it's more condensed there. And then you have just more conferences, right? Eight conferences. So inevitably there are going to be some that become then easier for, for teams to win. And there will be teams that win and lose if that were to ever happen and break out. So I hope I'm understanding that correctly, David, but I think your, uh, your hypothesis would be correct there that it, it could get tough. It could get tough for some teams that get splintered off into a, a more difficult division than what they currently have right now. Again, all this hypothetical because you know, the whole point of the show is nobody, nobody thinks this damn thing's going to happen. Nobody thinks it's going to happen. Appreciate you, David. Thank you for your support. Uh, Matthew. What's up, Matthew. Matthew says, uh, making plans for Manhattan for the K-State BYU baseball in May. Hey, love that. Uh, what's your favorite food joint close to the baseball stadium for good pregame atmosphere? Well, I would say, like, if you want pregame atmosphere, like, go to Aggieville. Aggieville's not too far away from uh, from the stadium. That's the, the bar and restaurant district for sure. And there are a ton of good options. I mean, I love Taco Lucha. Um, I think that's my favorite spot in Aggieville food wise. Um, so long saloon, which is like its sister restaurant, basically right there. Also great. If you would prefer like a burger, um, make sure at either one, you get the Chipotle blackberry, Chipotle raspberry bean dip. I believe that's what Chipotle raspberry bean dip. Um, you get the bean dip. It's, uh, it's great. I know the fruit part sounds a little bit weird, but it's incredible. Uh, it, it is the best thing. One of the, it's a very Manhattan thing. You definitely need to get that. So yeah, Aggieville is the way to really like experience what Manhattan has to offer. Go walk around there, check out some of the shops, check out some of the restaurants. Um, you know, other than that, if you want like fancier fare, like bourbon and Baker down on points is pretty good. Um, Manhattan brewing company is pretty good. Although that's, that's not going to be food. That's going to be just drinks. If you want that, that's also on points. So there are some starters, but hit me up on Twitter if you at JL Kurtz on Twitter if you want like a more detailed list of uh, of places to go. I would be more than happy uh, to help you with that uh, to explore Manhattan. But that's cool, man. Glad that you're going to be there and get to uh, experience it. I would love to hear how that goes as well. Uh, make sure to let me know. So, thank you, Matthew. You know, I've always got your back. Um, hit me up. Hit me up if you need anything else on that. Um, I see that. I see hiking cat. Hiking cat gave the the same recommendations there. Yep. Great minds, hiking cat. Great minds, hiking cat. Um, all right, so we're one step closer to directly paying players. Um, and this is an article that comes from Ross Dellinger, who reported this, I believe, on Thursday of this past week. Ross Dellinger says colleges are growing closer to having more of a hands-on role in arranging name, image, and likeness deals for their athletes than ever before. The NCAA's NIL Working Group has introduced a proposal that permits schools to provide, quote, assistance and services to their athletes in pursuit of NIL opportunities, including identifying opportunities for them, as well as even facilitating deals with third parties. So they can now basically work with these collectives, right? Third parties. Whereas that was, you know, the, like the Tennessee case and some of the ridiculous stuff that was going on, like had to do with interactions with collectives. We've all known for the last couple of years, this is how it's being facilitated is through these collectives it's been kind of dumb for the ncaa to try and police it and at least now if this proposal goes through we'll, we'll be done with that the collectives can basically do what it is that they've been doing this entire time um story continues the working group is recommending that ncaa division one council adopt the proposal as expedited legislation as okay boring they're trying to get it pushed through uh, the proposal was publicized in January, but has since been refined to focus specifically on a school's involvement in arranging NIL deals. 
The proposal is on a parallel track and interconnected with the NIL protections legislation that the council adopted in January. That legislation creates one, a voluntary registration process for NIL professional service providers, such as agents and advisors, uh, two, a disclosure database of all athlete NIL deals of $600 or more, and three, standardized NIL contracts, as well as a comprehensive educational plan. All of that seems great, right? If you're put together a registration process for people that are going to be helping out with this, like create more transparency in this. It will be better for the kids in knowing what they're getting into and, and be able to vet some of these people a little bit more that are getting involved here make sure that things are actually being taken care of, getting paid out and that the kids aren't going to get screwed by all this. And then a database of all of the deals and then standardized contracts. I also think is great. Like let's get all of this as standardized as you possibly can and have it more out in the open. Like here's the disclosure of all the NIL deals, get it, get it more out in the open. So the kids and allow the schools to be able to like actually talk about this more. So it's not hush hush and trying to hide it. So you don't wind up being an example like Tennessee, that's going to have to pay a bunch of legal fees just to fight the NCAA trying to come after them. It'll be better for the kids to know, Hey, school can lay out. This is what we got for you. Here are the deals. This is how much money it would be. We can be transparent and open with this instead of having to make them kind of operate a little bit more in the shadows, which is always going to lead to uh, a worse deal for all of them. Now, the other question that I think comes along with this is like, all right, so then how how close are we to uh, revenue sharing, which is the the ultimate end game of this? Eventually, we're going to get there, especially with the house case that I mentioned being less than 300 days away earlier in the show. When do we get to the end game, which is everyone's going to have to pay money directly like from the schools, which is going to very much favor Big Ten and the SEC with the extra money that they're going to have from their TV deals. That's another question lingering over this and how much of a step forward is it towards that? Um, the NCAA awarded the management of the agent registry, disclosure database, and educational plan to Teamworks. Sources told Yahoo Sports that's a technology platform and app already widely used within many college athletic departments. The deal between the NCAA and Teamworks has not been finalized. Uh, according to the working group's proposed legislation, Schools may only provide assistance to those athletes who have disclosed their contracts, according to the memo. So that leads to the transparency, right? You got to disclose your contracts and we will help you. This latest clarification of the NCAA's NIL policy brings closer schools and third-party NIL entities, such as booster-led collectives. The relationship between the two, school and collective, has been one of the murky issues in the NIL space. Uh, he gets to talking about Charlie Baker's plan. As part of NCAA President Charlie Baker's Project D1 plan, the NCAA was on the way to fully granting institutions the ability to both strike NIL deals with their own athletes and share revenue with them via a trust. Remember all of that? Schools would have to put a minimum amount into a trust for every single athlete uh, that would that would walk through their doors. You didn't have to opt into that, but the schools that did opt in would would be a part of this. Basically, if you want to be a part of the big time, you would have to opt into that. Uh, the first portion of that plan, direct NIL pay from schools, was expected to be further explored by a subcommittee of the D1 Council with a timeline of adoption of this summer. It's unclear where that plan or timeline currently stands, as it is likely impacted by ongoing legislation against the NCAA, most notably the House antitrust case. So saying like, hey, would would something like that come out before you get the ruling on that case? Because then maybe it has to change. Then maybe the system becomes totally different uh, after that. In the meantime, the council will explore and potentially adopt the new proposed legislation, giving schools more of a role in NIL. Yeah, I mean, look, you got to do this now. I mean, this this is this is good for the student athlete. If you care about the welfare of the student athlete, you need to do this now. It's also going to make life easier for the schools. It, this is certainly kind of like band-aid on a broken leg sort of thing, but it will help. It will make things a little bit better for everybody involved here. And time is of the essence for that. We need a little bit more. Um, so definitely, definitely hope that this gets passed. And I would imagine it would. I, I don't understand what real pushback would be on this from anybody. Um, pr the proposal would permit schools to identify specific NIL opportunities and facilitate deals between athletes and third parties. Um but there are caveats like the athlete can't receive the money directly from the school. So again, that was the whole idea of the collective in the first place. 
group that can raise the money. So the school is not giving it to them directly. Your donors donate to the collective, which is then given to the players. This money is not coming from TV money that's being given to the schools, for instance. Uh, schools will be permitted to contract with third-party service providers over NIL deals. Schools can't indirectly compensate athletes through those third parties. So the schools can't give money to the collective and then the collective give money to the athletes, right? Uh, can't find workarounds like that. There's your update. Um, there's your update on that front. And obviously, I think, you know, we all are interested in how that is going to work and it is better for the student athletes and all of that. But also, I just, you keep your eye on the ticking clock of when it is going to come that revenue sharing will be a part of this. And then that gets to me much more difficult for the big 12 and ACC to keep up um, because that is where that, that extra money in the TV deals can be put to very, very good use um, by even some of the lower tier schools in the big 10 or the sec. Everybody thought that that would happen with coaches. They'd be using it right now to poach coaches because they can pay so much more. We, we really haven't seen a whole lot of that. But when it comes then to like, hey, you can use it to directly pay players. I mean, it's already completely changed the NIL landscape right now, even in the last year where it's much more just all about money, all about the Benjamins. That's what recruiting is now. That's even like coaching carousel stuff, much more involved with that. You know, how much NIL can I actually um, be able to get here? Like that's 90% of recruiting right now. So if that's where it's at, I mean, it's going to have more of an effect there than kind of in an indirect way with the coaching hires. So. Part of the reason that I bring it up to you all here uh, is the importance as far as that goes. All right, let's hop back in here. This is this is probably I may cut it off a little bit early uh, tonight. I'm uh, not feeling so hot uh, today, so I may cut it off a bit early. So this is buzzer beater time. You got five to ten minutes here if you want to hop in before I get out of here. Appreciate all the guys for uh, for hanging out tonight. We'll start with Houston Cougars, Germany. What's up, Houston Cougars, Germany? And by the way, if you do want to hop in, click the dollar sign below the chat box. That is how you do that. Um, Houston Cougars, Germany. Service, Johan. Uh, if you want to see how evil the brown-shirted power two really are, give them more money. <laughs> Keep up the great work. Where's Juan? Uh, appreciate you, Houston Cougars, Germany, as always. Uh, Juan, yeah, Juan, fellow Houston fan. I've not seen one for a minute. Uh, we'll put the call out there, Houston Cougars, Germany. Hopefully that gets one back out here. You're uh, your, your Coug brethren there. And yeah, I mean, look, the, the last thing that they need is more money, but the SEC and the Big Ten are finding every single way to get more money at this point. So Cat's kind of out of the bag on that. I don't know how you're going to stop them from, from taking in more money now and the more that they get. Yeah, more money, more problems, right? Wise man once said. Uh, they will continue to, to twist and contort things to their advantage as much as possible. And the more money they get, the more power they have, and the more that will continue to go and go and go um, until something breaks and something is untenable. And maybe we get some kind of drastic change, but that, that seems much more like a splinter off into two separate entities than an 80-team Super League, obviously, as has been much the theme of the show here tonight. Hiking Cat. What's up, Hiking Cat? Thank you, Houston Cougars, Germany, by the way. Appreciate your support, my friend. As is the case with Hiking Cat. Uh, Hiking Cat says, breaking K-State news. Yoki just announced she is back. And thank God for GT, uh, Gene Taylor. Uh, nice to beat an SEC school for a coach. Yeah, it's been a good week at K-State as far as that goes. Ayoka Lee, All-American, one of the best centers in college basketball coming back for another year. That is awesome news. I had heard a little bit before popping on here. That was probably going to happen. Tremendous news for Jeff Mitty and company uh, who are four seed in the NCAA tournament this year. And I saw we're in uh, a preseason top 20. I think they were like 17th in ESPN's preseason top 25 for next year. That was out there earlier today. And it was based on the assumption that Aoka Lee would probably be back. So uh, that's very good news. And uh, great news for K-State as well was keeping Jerome Tang. As the head coach, Arkansas had a lot of interest. It was a pretty tense, pretty tense Friday when all of that was really starting to surface and there was real legitimate concern that he would leave. Chris Beard turned the job down. All the attention from Arkansas turned to Jerome Tang and he opted to stay. And hey, I'll just tell you this, Hiking Cat. I mean, as stressful as that was, I think that could be a massive blessing in disguise because it's now been reported widely that part of what happened was getting a process put in place that can keep Richard Linton out of decisions with student athletes moving forward, which is huge. 
and one of the biggest things that was an issue for Jerome Tang at K-State. They've, they've shored up the NIL. That is not a problem. He's got enough money to go out and put together a great roster, and now he's got the meddling president backed off a little bit. That could be wildly important down the stretch or over the next couple of years if Jerome Tang continues to have the success that I think we all feel like he is going to. So we may have kind of dodged a bullet here. You get all that out of the way, show him all the support this year, and then next year, two years from now, if bigger boys come calling, maybe there's some loyalty built up and you've got all the infrastructure here that you could possibly give him to give him as much opportunity to stay as possible. Doesn't mean that it's going to always work like that, but I feel so, so, so much better about it at this time this week than I did at this time last week. So we had to sweat it out, but I think it'll be, I think it'll be good for us in the long run, hiking cat. I definitely, definitely do. Okay. I may go ahead and cut it off there, guys. Again, I'm sorry. I'm I am not not feeling the greatest, not feeling the greatest. Um, so uh, I hope all of you guys have a, uh, a wonderful rest of your week. I owe you a couple of videos here. We'll get you one on uh, the Florida State update. Although if you do want some really good insight on that, I assume most of you saw earlier this week, I posted a couple of videos over the last couple of days with uh, Matt Baker from the Tampa Bay Times, who was really good. He's been I mean, you heard him say in that video how many pages of legal documents he's read. Like, he's going through every single little thing in the Florida State and ACC cases, uh, Clemson and the ACC, everything that's happening there in that conference. He offers some some really good insight, including that last video, man. He said, hey, don't discount. Don't discount the Big 12 um, and the being a match potentially at, uh, under some circumstance for Florida State and Clemson, which – was surprising to me, uh, but he did throw that out there, and uh, I think he's he's just very insightful all the way around. So appreciate Matt for taking the time to join me on the channel. Make sure you watch those videos. I also very much owe you a reaction video to Brett Yormark's comments on, on 365 Sports, so should be getting that to you shortly as well. If you could like the video on your way out, I would much appreciate that. That would be great. John Dashkurt, Stash 4 on Venmo. If you're not catching this live and you want to, be a part of the next show. You can leave me a question or comment there. Uh, Matthew, appreciate you, Matthew. He says, feel better. Thanks for the content. You're welcome, guys. I'm here for you. Uh, toughing it out to bring you the content. And uh, appreciate all of you guys being here. Tell your friends, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, threads, wherever you're at on social media, let them know. Word of mouth. Let's continue to grow the channel. Same departing message that I leave you with every single time. Uh, take care. Enjoy the rest of your evenings. Have a great start to your week, and I will talk to you all soon.